listening to the Bigfoot Society podcast, and I'm Jeremiah Byron. Every week I talk to individuals who have experienced Sasquatch in some way or another, so you won't want to miss an episode. Make sure you're subscribed on the platform that you're listening to, and share this episode with a friend. It does not cost a thing, and it helps the show continue to grow. If you'd like to hear Bigfoot Society episodes early and ad-free, you can do so by becoming a Patreon supporter or a YouTube channel member. Links to those are in the show notes. In Bigfoot Society, I've taken far too much of your time so far, so let's get on with the show. All right, Bigfoot Society, I've got the privilege of talking to Mr. Tobe Johnson. You may have heard of him from the Owl Moon Lab. How's it going, Tobe? It's good to uh, finally meet you, Jeremiah. Thanks for having me on. You got it, man. Oh, uh, allow me to, I'm going to, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about, I want to talk about Owl Moon Lab just a little bit. Okay. Um, It's a really good book, dude. Like I picked it up a few days ago and I started reading it and I was like, yeah, maybe this is spread out over a few days. And it was like, boom, no, got to keep reading it. Got to keep reading it. It is, it's well-written. Also, I love how Doug Hycheck puts in the QR codes. You've got these little Easter egg evidence things spattered about. You've got sounds, you got videos, you got interviews. It's just, it's the most amazing book reading experience and hats off to you. It's a great book, dude. Appreciate that, Jeremiah. Yeah, it was the QR codes came at the behest of, Doug's son, I believe it was mm. Blaine Hycheck, who's infamous for being in the Snail Grove episode yeah. of Monster <laughs> Quest. And it has taken off. I think there's another book in the works through their publisher that Dave Ellis is doing. And I think oh. they even have a name for it now. I think they're calling it like embedded sound technology or something like that. So it's a really cool concept that adds a lot of fun to a book to where it brings you back to those choose your own adventure days where books are interactive. And I had already embraced trying to do a YouTube channel, the same venture where people could choose my adventure for me. And I thought, shoot, I can't do all the things I love to do. So this is good. Let's just embrace writing this chapter down of my life. It's tough once in a while getting any feedback from people when you do an artistic venture like that. And sometimes you don't necessarily want to know the public's feedback. (laughs) I'm a new author. For me, it was their new publishing company. So for us, it was just us doing what we love. And Doug is such, if there's one person people need to hang out with, it's Doug, Blaine, and Alex, the high check, Uh you know, trio. Absolutely. I, he he definitely knows his stuff. You can tell. The Owl, Owl Moon Lab. Holy mackerel. If I was listeners, if in October, I hope you take this the right way. But listeners, remember how when you were watching Hellier and you were like, wow, this just gets crazier and like twists and turns and stuff you didn't ex- expect and synchronicities. And if you like that, you're really going to like this book. It's in the same family of of stories totally different of course but if you dig hellier you're gonna dig owl moon lab i just i kept getting that same vibe which as a big compliment yeah i was a big fan of that documentary a lot of people haven't seen it yet go watch this documentary it's incredible it's like a two-part saga forget anything on netflix forget Dahmer. (laughs) go watch hellier when we were in lockdown hellier was happening and for me it was just so much deja vu of how they were building this unexpected synchronistic narrative. And it was just something that everybody was affected by. And everyone was affected by this story in the same way. Because when you find out that magic is real and that it somehow dances in the world of Bigfoot, that's something that a lot of people can't get behind. And maybe not everybody should. This could very well be something only meant for specific people during a specific time. And I think this was my time. (laughs) I love that. Let's take a second and let's make sure that 
the listeners are on the right page with what they need to know about you. And that's the crazy thing. You've got so much going on. What do you want people to know? You've got so many things you could throw out there. Oh, man. I was just a fanboy like everybody else starts out. 2008, I start a podcast called Bigfoot Air. It Hmm. is based upon my passion of looking into the mysteries of the Pacific Northwest, growing up just right outside of uh, Eugene, Oregon, go Ducks. And so I was tapping into Talk Shoes Wavelength, which was really the beginning of everything else we know as podcasts. And I interview a guy named Henry Franzoni, who's an author out of Washington State, a scientist that worked with Peter Byrne and a guy named, I believe his name, John Glickman. And they did a $5 million comprehensive study of Sasquatch underneath Mount Hood. Now, this is a little bit of a long story. However, the concentration to talk to somebody like Henry and pay attention to what he said really was on deaf ears on my part because of the fact that I didn't know any of these players here. Peter mm-hmm. Byrne seemed like this guy that to me, he smacked of one of the Vegas you know, as far as like being a good fella or something like he was bigger than life. This guy was rock star Vegas stuff. Totally. So for Henry to be attached to them. I was a little bit of a fanboy talking to these guys. And then they pretty much just told me Henry did is that like, hey, slow down. You can experience this stuff yourself. I All you it. have to do is go out and find a place on the map that has a spooky, scary name. Hence his book, Spirit of Seattle. And so before Google Earth, before any of that, I just hopped on an old fashioned map in my trunk and just started picking out areas that sounded crazy. And that kind of led to meeting these witnesses along the way that I write about in the book. And I call these people extended experiencers of Sasquatch interaction. Totally. So these EESIs were what I was trying to seek out, but I didn't quite know how to do it. And so that took me getting to know more people like Henry Franzoni and Tom Powell and Ron Moorhead. That advice you just gave was awesome, but I, I want to unpack it a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So let's say a listener wants to do this and they find like Skookum Lake, Iowa, which is mm-hmm. not a place, but so they find, and then what's the next step? Do they start talking to people in that town? Do they start to go into like bars in the town be like, Hey, does anyone know any stories? Yeah. yeah. What I decided to do was go into the bar and do monthly meetings and just very assumingly suggested to this was during the 2000 real estate crash, housing crash. So a lot of people were hurting 2007, 2008. They didn't really know it yet, but they were. And so on a Wednesday night, once a month, we would have monthly, basically like Bigfoot A&A meetings. People would show up, grab a pint. Not saying I don't have one here myself. We're, <laughs> we're sitting there once a month telling these Bigfoot stories and it turns into a thing, right? This is the beginning of the town hall phenomena. And so in a little town of Lieberg, Oregon, I would have people start coming up after the show, after the eyewitness testimonies were over where roadside crossings are the most popular type. I would have people come up to me after the show. I'm putting away the PA system and they're saying, Hey, this is uh, this has followed me home and we've got stuff happening right down the highway from us here. Those are the kind of stories that I had been hearing three years prior to me doing these live events. And we skipped a lot of territory along the way here. However, I think it's important just to get into the meat and potatoes, which Uh are these Sasquatch contactees, which probably is a better suited name for what we're talking about, because much like the contactees of the UFO world, these people are no less affected In fact, there's cross-contamination between the forensic evidence and the anecdotal experiences, witness accounts. For that reason, if I had to do it over again, I probably would have gone with that name there, but maybe that's for part two down the road. So that's what I started to embrace are these people stopping me on the way to the parking lot and tapping me on the shoulder saying, hey, this is much weirder than that guy was saying on the stand up there. And they followed me home. And so that's where things really start taking off. Incredible. When I was reading your book, that is also that idea you had where it's like, how do I get to these people? How do I hear the story? Make a hangout town hall in a local pub and they'll come to you. And that was that is so smart, dude. Wasn't trying to connive away 
to do anything. It just was synchronicity ah. with the fact that there was a witness at a pizza parlor and this witness was really eager about his close encounter and he was our first witness. And so it was just, you know, my adrenaline to meet these people that had this backyard Bigfoot phenomena, like Sally Shepard Walford describes in her book, Valley of the Skookum, or Julie mm. Scott describes in her book from up here in the Olympics Peninsula, where they're talking about the phenomena coming to their own backyard and that this is much stranger. And so I wanted to get to whether or not this was true, because it seemed as though it'd be very easy to debunk. And this could just very well be a flesh and blood answer and cross contamination for maybe the UFO phenomena. And I thought maybe they have the two worlds confused, but secretly I was hoping it was way cool. Like this actually is. And right. uh, boy, oh boy was, I know, I guess Tom Powell was right. Ron Moorhead was right. This is a much cooler phenomena than the average flesh and blood Bigfooter would ever have you to believe. That's awesome. And I'm just going to ask you straight out. What do you think Bigfoot is? Oh, we're going right to it. Why not? I've asked, I guess, in a sense, I get into it a little bit in the book. And the quick answer is I think there's some kind of land spirit. They're both. Mm. They're physical and non-physical. They're as the Native Americans have tried to tell us, in some cases, warn us about that this phenomena is a spiritual journey of some kind. And it's a part of that spirit journey, just like all of these other phenomena that you can't put in a box and you can't photograph and you can't, there's no amount of, look at the Pentagon right now, just everything they're going through right now to say, listen, <laughs> this is so strange. This is, mm -hmm. if we're to believe what's coming out of Lou Elizondo's mouth and Jeremy oh Corbell's mouth and what's oh, going on at Skinwalker Ranch, there's some interesting crossover between the Al Moon Lab and all these power spots in Utah. And secretly, we called this place a skin twin. There's so much information being thrown at you in a hot spot. Mm. And I think for far too long, these, these places have been overlooked because they've been discounted as, well, that can't be sasquatch evidence that's something else and i get it although look at where we are look at where we are today with what we have to actually show our colleagues in the university it's not really moved a whole lot until i say this ufo stuff started popping up now we're in different categories and uh -huh. you go to these conferences and you see a lot of people at these ufo conferences hearing bigfoot conversations going Stopping people in the parking lot and saying, hey, wow. it's like this too. But yeah. And the thing is, is that it's not, I don't think it's far out of the question to connect UFO and big, look at, for example, Stan Gordon in the Chestnut Ridge area of Pennsylvania. Like this is not just like, this has happened in other areas where there's connections between UFO sightings and Bigfoot sightings. Like yeah, I think there's something to it for sure, Tobe. But I get, I understand, and they're right. The flesh and blood world is absolutely correct when they blame people that are looking at the paranormal to solve all of the gray areas. Hmm. And I talk a little bit about in the book how intolerable it is for me to deal with these people, not only at conferences, but just watching them online and share their evidence and it's not very good and it's just easy to debunk. However, we have quite a bit of forensic data that really hasn't seen the light of day that has been looked at from people from all, all different backgrounds that aren't Bigfooters. Wow. And it was collected in some really strange circumstances. And now I find myself sharing it with people from Utah, people like Daryl Sims, right? Who looks into alien abductions and implants and things like that. We're oh, coming wow. away with a lot of private conversations that say, hey, there's some interesting cross contamination here going on with these phenomena. I don't know how we've missed this. So I've looked past the Gigantopithecus answer here and been happy that I've done that because Hey, this is a lot more fun when you're digging into the truth and not shutting down and sequestering all of these witnesses and saying, OK, tell your story this way. And this is going to go online this way. If anything, the last three years has proven to me is that silence does not reveal the truth. Mm -hmm. And if anybody's trying to shut you down and shut you up, 
woe to yourself Look to out. hang out with them for Look very out. long because they have an agenda and I have no agenda. There's a lot that we've debunked along the way about our own story and figured out because it takes a while to debunk stuff. Sometimes it takes years, but I've invited at least 20 different people to come to this area and at least five of them now have adopted this area as their own. And now they're having their own experiences. And oh. uh, that's just the kind of legacy that I think should be left behind when you're looking into this is just total transparency and, and honesty and try to be light about it and a little bit humorous. Also, when someone tr starts to try to shut down what you're talking about, that usually means you got something there and they don't want you to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, a reaffirming in a way. Let's let's go to here. What was the first situation where you realized I'm not really sure what's going on here or like your introduction to Bigfoot was there a certain time you can pinpoint where it's like what is going on? Mm. Yeah, the the evidence was coming in basically immediately when I started doing things on my own. One of the first places I went was at the behest of researcher Autumn Williams, who had researched oh, an area sure. called Bohemia, which is east of Cottage Grove, Oregon. And that's where the Al Moon takes place. And she basically called this mountainside her research area. It's where Mysterious Encounters had filmed a couple episodes with Matt Moneymaker. Doug Eichek mm -hmm. produced it. And she started showing me the area. And I didn't live too far. I lived like an hour away, maybe an hour and a half. So I would get up in that area. I was working for UPS at that time. And I came back with some interesting evidence that, yeah, they seem to be up in the cliffs there. There's what looks like a fresh nest in the back of a cave on a vertical cliff about 1500 feet up above this old mining town. And that got me thinking, okay, so there she's not chasing imagination. There's something physical going on here and the miners are talking. Now the locals are showing up at these Bigfoot and beers that we're having and they're telling their story about the Bohemia area. And so that got me thinking as far as, okay, I can invest some time and money and effort into this as well. And so I did, I started going to pretty much, first of all, I would just knock on people's houses or if I saw them sitting oh, out on wow. the patio watching traffic, like literally people would be how, I don't know if people do this in the country in your area, but in the country in Cottage Grove, they'll sit out on their Davenports on the patio and they're yeah, yeah. traffic. And this yeah. is like the retired thing to do. Yep. And if they have a Sasquatch carving in their front yard, even better. And so all those things were confirming to me, but the first thing that really happened that seemed to shake up the waters for it just being a flesh and blood issue was the discussion of the lights. Someone mm. had said to me, a close a gal friend of mine, researcher Beth Heikinen, said, eventually you're going to see these lights, man. And I said, well, what do I expect? She goes, I don't know. They're in Bigfoot areas. They could be small. They could be large. But generally they're short and they're fleeting and they're they're alive. I'll never forget. She said that she goes there. They're alive somehow. They're organic. Don't think UFO. And we we're up above this area where we did Bigfoot and beer, a place we called Oz. Yes. And it was in that extended experience or connective issue where I had two different houses that basically said the hill behind us is active with Bigfoot stuff. And they gave me permission to go up there anytime I wanted. And that's when one night I saw this huge light above the hillside, above this abandoned helo pad launch. And it was just a magnificent white star being born in the middle of the forest that was so big, so piercing, so bright, so close in front of the tree line, less than, I don't know, probably about 150 to 200 yards away. And it was just like a pyrotechnic. It was like a, wow. a Van Halen show. Like you expected to hear a boom or blast sound and it stair stepped through the tree four different times. And it was just like, here you go. Here's another one. And it took about 45 minutes or so for this to happen. And 
So we kept coming back to that area. And eventually my, I would stay, try to stay the night there and my tent would be moved 49 feet and it would yes. be stuck in a tree. That part messed with my head, dude. Yeah. That was wild. But see, now that could have been a crazy landowner that I never met. Yeah, right? but like, it's 50 feet. It's up in a tree, though. I moved 49 feet and it went up about eight feet on top of a rhododendron bush, which oh, okay. our rhododendrons are like trees. Yeah. But everything was facing the right way. Right. My maps and my tent fly had not blown away. They were still 49 feet where the tent was. Candy wrappers, stickers wrappers should blow away or whatever. And then we saw more lights. And it just got to the point where the neighbors are just like, we see lights too. And they're coming in our house. Whoa. And the Bigfoots are involved with this. They're like sitting there watching my kids in the bay window. And I don't know what to expect now that we have these lights and these silhouetted giant monkey men sitting Indian style watching my daughters that refuse to take a photograph. And uh, so that was the spot like that gave mm -hmm. me permission to say, okay, so I'm not going to discount any more claims of paranormal Bigfoot. And then I had something run up behind me oh that goodness. sounded like uh, an elephant on two legs in the middle of the day between these two houses on an abandoned skid road where there was this fresh bisected vole that had no predation marks. It looked like it had been pinched and separated and placed on the single trail I just That's came crazy. in on. And this is a thing, right? Along the mm -hmm. way here, we'll be mentioning things that I don't hear a lot of other Bigfooters talk about, but little tiny moles and voles set up in the middle of trails, mice. It's a Bigfoot thing. I'm not saying Bigfoot does it, but it, it's a cause and effect thing. If you look into it, it may erupt something to happen. In this case, I had what I thought was an upset landowner come running behind me on two legs, right? Like an 800 pound man and stop just as I turned around. And it was only 12 inches or so from that last footprint, which makes the ground move when it's running. Wow. So that was, what do you do with that? I knew what to do with that. For me, it was the ultimate appeal of an endless mystery. I knew that immediately these things were never going to let me solve it, but I could have one hell of a time living and embracing that world from time to time. It's just, it, it, and that's when the book started, I was reading it and that the Oz part in all that. And I was like, Oh my goodness, what is going on with this book? And then it just keeps going just wilder and wilder. And Oh man, it, it just, it, it is literally like the stuff you're bringing up. It's almost like you're experiencing these like Skinwalker Ranch type areas in the Pacific Northwest, which is just, it's yeah. mind blowing, dude. They're all over there. They really are something special, but I don't think they're unique. I just like Bigfoot. Hmm. Bigfoot is special. I don't think it's unique. Telling the story is what unique. Seeing these things is not unique or having an experience. It's just not. I don't believe that for a second. I've talked to too many people. They've seen more of these, I think, than cougars. These are just as rampant yeah. as UFO and ghost sightings. The, the problem is that nobody wants to talk about it because you have Bigfoot on bumper stickers and it just sounds like the most goofy thing in the world that you saw a wild monkey man. And then you add in magic to the element. It turns into this other area of the loony bin. And so... You just can't care what people think. You got to find your own tribe to hang out with and just the rest of them be damned. You just got to embrace the weird. What's the end goal for you with all of this research? Is there a goal, goal you have in, in mind where you reach that point and you'll be like, okay, I finally, like, I'm here. Oh, gosh. If I could see what Adam Davies saw. Hmm. That'd be a pretty good, I'd be okay. That would be a good like drop off point, not drop off, like end it all. But if I could have saw what those three gentlemen saw, because I talked to him that night when that happened. Do you mind refreshing the the listeners on what that sure. scenario was? They, they're up in, a, in an area well known for Matt Johnson's habituation area, which sure. he called Soha. Mm -hmm. And Adam Davies and John Carlson were there to debunk Matt's claims. 
and they saw a portal open up and two creatures enter and exit the building or <laughs> the building, the <laughs> opening. And it was very specific on what they describe. It's, it's in his new book, which came out only a couple of weeks ago. I believe it's called Portals and Monsters. And it talks a little bit about that encounter. That's a very, it should change this conversation. And it just hasn't because of the fact that it's so crazy sounding. Hmm. But that's something that I don't know that they necessarily ever want to talk about. I'm talking about it now because he's written a book about it and they've done a podcast. And I think sure. it's an important part of Bigfoot lore. And I thought we would see something like that at the Al Moon. I really did because it was getting to the point where we weren't backing down and I'm sleeping right next to the phenomena 24 seven for almost a year straight, not getting much sleep, just totally concentrating on seeing a moment like that happen. And we got a couple of interesting photographs, but I never got to see something like that happen. And I think along the way, we're going to have to embrace the idea of there being invisible doorways, window areas, or portals. It's certainly what they did at Skinwalker Ranch. And that's, that's part of the Pentagon's investment and in looking into Skinwalker was descriptions of seeing Sasquatch enter and exit glowing exactly. portals over the Mesa. Mm -hmm. exactly. They said they saw werewolves smoking cigars with fedoras on. <laughs> the <laughs> Pentagon did not back down from that, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, this is a much more interesting phenomenon than just Bigfoot and Bluff Creek. It's just, it seems like there's all, it seems like there's all these different areas starting to pop up around the country, really. And it just, it feels like something's going to happen and it's all going to get tied together somehow. I, I don't know. It just, it feels like it has to someday, but I don't know. We'll see. Maybe that's part know. of the allure, trying to put all the strings on the right dots and figure it out. Do you mind sharing a little bit about, you alluded to how things were just getting crazier and crazier in the Owl Moon area. What kind of things were you experiencing? The whole area is, it has so much history to it as far as mm. Bigfoot and UFOs and ghosts. And maybe because it's the shape of the land, right? I don't know if I spoke about this in the book or not, but the geology of these places here, they talk a lot about Bigfoot habitat, but they don't talk about geomancing, which is a type of looking into magical ramifications for geology and doing things mm. in that geology to amp it up. And so maybe some of that stuff had happened previous to even the white man or natives being there for that matter. And what I mean is that it was in a parabolic dish shape. And you'll hear that Dr. Travis Taylor talk Just about. Just like the Uinta Basin. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my So those goodness, parabolic dude. dish shapes are all over the globe and they're hot spots. They're also where there are conductive waterways, copper veins, quartz. Yes. And in this case, a lot of gold and iron. And so those going down one of the main rivers into Cottage Grove on two different subsections of the Umpqua Forest. And maybe that's why I know the military is really interested in doing flyovers of both of those areas there. There's Skinwalker. Of, Skinwalker. I'm not quite sure as far as the military is concerned. There's been some interesting vehicles that we've seen for a long time, blacked out SUVs. Oh, and wow. a lot of fighter jets probably going out to Nellis, probably going out to Area 51 or sure. uh, coming out from the Pacific. And they'll tilt their wings periodically from a pretty low altitude to let you know that, hey, we see you in your boat out there fishing and we're one of you. Don't worry about it. But there's also black triangles that have been seen over the Coburg Hills at less than 500 feet off of I-5. And this Coburg hillside, I was actually chased I don't know who chased us out, but when you're chased out by five black SUVs around two in the morning and you have your son in the back seat with his with the neighborhood buddy, there's they're just go, going out for a lark going Bigfoot and with the crazy neighbor, right? Yeah. And we get chased out by black SUVs. That was not um, in the book. No, because I yeah, it was connected a little bit to the area, but it wasn't 
Almond proper, really. It was okay. in, in a different area, but wow, five SUVs. Uh, yeah. That's and maybe wild, we just man. got too close to, I don't know, maybe pot smugglers are up there or whatever. But sure. then I've had people tell me that they've seen power lines going into the mountain in that area that don't make any sense that they these giant power boxes end at this road and there's power lines going into the mountain that was told me to me by a dj that's well respected out of eugene oregon a guy named bill london so interesting area but very unassuming like it's a college town it's oregon duck country it's hippie country it's left to center politics country and then it's a mill town and that's what it's known for is just being the West Coast, left coast. And that's it. And so to add all this other stuff, the paranormal or Bigfoot, there was really no tolerating it in and around Eugene Springfield. So I had to re-amp these live events that I was doing. And that's where I started to go into this little bar called the Axe and Fiddle in Cottage Grove. And said, you know what? I'll just start these up again under a new name, new bar, okay. same premise that we're going to get locals to tell their crazy stories. And they didn't really as much as I was hoping that they would. I actually had to bring people in on the big screen and do Zoom meetings like we're doing. And I was never really that happy with it just for the fact that Cottage Grove wasn't embracing it as much as I was hoping they would. Sure. But then I met Daryl Adams, who totally embraced the phenomena. And he said, in fact, I'm retired. I live in Cottage Grove. I've got nothing but time. And if you want to move in and research this with us, go right ahead. Come research Bigfoot at our house rent free. Wow. And that's where when you start to... In the book, when you start to have that connection with Daryl, mm-hmm. it just seems like that's when it it just, it almost switches gears. And like the stuff that you're hearing on that property, it's so hard. And I'm not even, I wasn't even involved. And it's hard for me to wrap my mind around it. I can't imagine what you guys are thinking when you're hearing, pretty much you're hearing EVPs, you're hearing the sides of the buildings get get slapped up against all di- all different types of not just Bigfoot activity, but also like almost paranormal activity, you would think. Mm. And it's like, how do you explain that? In 2012, there was a, a large trackway cast in the mm. drained out lake bed, a cottage grove reservoir. It was found by a guy named Max Roy, who was a used car salesman, and he liked to fix up cars at barn finds basically so while he was traveling along london road on, in cottage grove oregon he was walking along the bike path there the warehouser road actually which is now the bike path looking at old cars and barns on the side of the road and got tipped off by this weirdo on a rain slicker with a dog that said hey there's weird tracks down there i got some pictures of them so i don't know be on the lookout wow this started what was called the london trackway Mm-hmm. And so my son got a knock on the door from this Max Roy and said, hey, I saw you had a, a Bigfoot sticker on your Jeep. I've got these photographs of these Bigfoot tracks. If you're interested, maybe you want to go look at them. And so that that phone call from my son with those photos there really set the tone for the Al Moon Lab in 2018. So between 2012 and 2018 was basically five years of me saying, OK, Cottage Grove is a lot closer than the places I've been going to. I'll just start investing all my time talking to the locals down here. And so I got to know the area based upon this trackway. Now, the trackway itself is still a mystery. It's under dispute because of Cliff and Meldrum's opinion on what the forensics show with that issue. But there's over 122 tracks five feet apart for over 100 yards. And there's some interesting anatomy that's never been addressed as far as I'm concerned about that trackway. But now Tom Powell owns the majority of the tracks and sure. it is what it is with the, the trackway. Regardless, the area still persisted with Bigfoot reports. People were telling me they saw what they call a blue eyed spider. And I said, what's that look like? And it looked like a spider crawling on the ground eight oh, feet long no. with these glowing blue eyes. Yeah. 
And then someone, one of the neighbors would eventually tell us that he saw an upright blue-eyed bear advance on him while he was getting his kindling. So I'm hearing all this glowing blue-eyed stuff of this creature crawling around. There's a board-certified psychologist, uh, along with a guy named Chris Manier, who's a BFRO guy, another guy named John Bull, all behind the Owl Moon Lab. Four of these guys, I'll see, I believe, three Bigfoot in the moonlight, very close totally shaken up by what they'd seen. And the stories just kept getting bigger and bigger. So fast forward to 2018, and here's this guy named Daryl Adams said, hey, come play Bigfoot with me, and you can research full time. I was a truck driver at those in those days. And that's when things really took off at that invitation. Oh, man, it's just, it's wild. It's wild. And then, it seems it doesn't really let up either. You read in the book and it's just like, it almost, did it feel like when you're researching that area that things kept escalating and escalating or how did you feel? I knew it was lightning in a bottle when it happened. I had mm -hmm. the hindsight of looking at the rest of these researchers cases and I just thought it would end a lot quicker. So when I got my recorders out and the cameras and moved my trailer on the property there, I thought this is probably going to blow over in 30 days. It, I can't imagine it being prolonged like, like it was. So I just kept wait, waiting for it to go, all go away. And but it was still really cool. We, we found these giant knee impressions, which mm. seemed to be plus or minus 1,400 pounds with anomalous hairs coming up out of the red clay, tree structures above the knee impressions or what look like tree structures. Certainly there was something weird in the trees or on the trees above those knees. And then we're getting confirmation from these flesh and blood people that, yeah, there's evidence to these impressions. A, you're right, they're from an extremity and they look to be knee impressions. And these flesh and blood people are telling me, hey, this hair is anomalous. I've looked at over 200 other hairs that people have sent me throughout the years. Yours is number five or six, and I'm willing to write your report. I'm like, okay, but wait. Hi, I'm Crazy Tobe Johnson. Nice to meet you. Do you still <laughs> want to work with me? <laughs> and they were saying, yeah, because I've never heard or seen anything like this. Or if I have... What's valid. And this is what I would call good to go. So I was really happy for the fact that we're bridging this gap with people that wanted to just look into the evidence, no matter how much weirdness was connected to it, because the weirdness would start coming immediately when we would get these knee impressions, we would cast them and we put the on the garage. And once the once the knees sat in that garage, it was like a business card saying, hey, we look into weirdness and we're happy to serve you. And it all just came right down the hillside or up the creek. I don't know. I remember a part of the book where it, it's, I think you have a realization that, oh no, I've got a ton of Bigfoot hair in the garage. And that could be pretty much attracting the craziness to, yeah. and it's, yeah, I think why it's not? That, it's that one. Right. Oh, nice. That and here. Cool. Wow. Yeah. That one, I believe, is off of the door. It was attached to a greasy handprint that almost bent like rubber. And this greasy substance, for a long time, Bigfooters have been overlooking as just being slimy mud or ash. A lot of people say it's just dust or ash. But there's more going on with these handprints. And thank God for someone like Doug Highcheck and exactly. Billy Covington, Montana, because yep. now this stuff is being appreciated as being highly different than mud or ash when it attaches itself to something like a painted door. You can't get this stuff off. You can't scrub it off. Eventually, you're going to have to repaint it again, especially painted things like cars, doors, plastics. Because it changes, it mutates the polymers, according to Doug Highcheck, at a molecular level, and it destroys and degrades it, especially plastics and fabrics, like a tent. So we would find these things almost coming, they were at the stage for you here. The knees were inside this locked brand new shop, which was big enough to park two RVs in. 
had a brand new cement floor. My trailer's parked outside and all that's surrounding the trailer and the garage and the main house is a small patch of yard and a bunch of gravel. And so to get from A to B, it was gravel, very little grass and sidewalk to ambulate around. So you should hear something coming. So when we would set out our audio equipment, very few times did we ever get the sound of anything approaching, although we did and it was pretty incredible a couple different times. But when you find large greasy handprints, twice the size of any given man that are slimy with red or black hair mm. attached to it, and you can see the palm striations and you can see the friction ridges and the dermals and you can appreciate that, um, you know, someone's hoaxing you, they're going through an extra effort here, just like the London right. tracks. The last time I heard about the London tracks being hoaxed was a landscaper that said he did it in a pair of diving flippers. This was far beyond diving flippers and a landscaper. This was someone setting up, I don't know, 3D printing their hand and then expanding it 50% and making a rubber casting and then getting hair that looked like Sasquatch hair, according to Cindy Dosen and getting be a lot that. of work. Yeah, it would just it, been an elaborate yeah. hoax to the which I would have been proud to meet them afterwards and say, <laughs> bravo. <laughs> and I still would, too, with the London tracks, whoever, if someone does take credit for that. They, I would like to know who they were and, and see how they did it again, because they went through so much work to pull that off. And they knew so much about attributes of Sasquatch in the same way that they hmm. someone hoaxed any evidence at the Al Moon Lab. They know so much about the reported behavior and including this Alba Vernick stuff. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. So the Owl Moon Lab you no longer have access to that area, correct? We do have access to the area behind it and in front of okay. it. Mostly it's behind it because that's where the reports come out of the woods behind it. Because the main property, what it was sold, correct? To Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. For no spooky reason. Okay. Um, it was just sold because of a job opportunity on Daryl's gotcha. wife's end. Sure. Yeah. Do you are you do you still have communication with that landowner at all or pretty much no communication? Yeah. The last thing I heard was Daryl got a phone call or he no, he saw that he saw them at Walmart. OK, where everybody has their Bigfoot reports. So, <laughs> yeah. so he sees the new homeowners and they're talking and just saying, hey, I think we're going to move again. And not the new owners, but Daryl. Sure. And he said, hey, anything weird happen at your place? And they said, no. yeah, something like a huge man in the dead of night ran across our front oh, patio. No, that's the way they accounted for it. Now I can tell you that I did go there. We filmed on site. They allowed us 48 hours while they're on vacation to film part two of flash of beauty. So when flash of beauty is oh, this man. documentary that I've been a part of for the last two years, besides this book. And so part one came out Memorial day weekend this year. And it's a interview. It's a witness intro or a witness perspective of how Sasquatch changed their life. And part two looks at the paranormal Bigfoot phenomena. So we got permission to to stay on the property for two days and film. And there was some interesting stuff that I saw myself. Now we didn't have anything happen. Large rocks that I remember showing up in places showed up in places that they played off bird feeders were taken off of branches and set weird spots those are the small little nuanced things that we paid attention to these little totems or little gifts that mm. were tributes of some kind and set in weird spots and that's really how the owl moon started for us is by paying attention to the sounds and the little tiny things that had happened and saying oh that's out of place uh, mm -hmm. it's a, in, let's definitely talk about Flash of Beauty. Uh, one, it, it's a, it's one of the most beautiful documentaries I've seen in a long time. It's just, it's extremely well put together, thought out. I'm curious, how was it that you got set up with being involved with that documentary to begin with? Ron Moorhead was talking with Daryl Adams, the property owner, mm -hmm. at a 
private function called Beachfoot. Ron, sure. at the same time, was being approached by this production company about what he knew about the Sierra sounds. And they said, hey, I just talked to this guy named Daryl Adams, and he's researching with a guy that, and that's how it happened, is really Daryl showing up at Beachfoot. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> that's it is all about who you know, and um, of course, Beachfoot helps too. It's well, it's all about showing up. Uh -huh. Like people that don't show up to these things because uh, personal issues, or they don't like to stay at functions or whatever. You have to go to these places, like these conventions, and meet people because that's how you exactly have the snowball effect start happening and you increase your game and so daryl would show up at these events with or without me or i would show up at some and we would just always cover each other's back with this story hey we have these knee impressions and now there's this weird stuff happening around these knees it seemed like and so the production crew came down and we're no frills we're sitting on the tailgate as they had a camera on us and Daryl had already sold the property and this is long since the story when it's fullest had really happened and so we're retelling this husband and wife team Jill and Brett and their yeah. cameraman Mike and their jaws just hit the ground and they didn't know how weird <laughs> the story was really gonna get and I said don't take our word for it it's right down here about a mile away do you want to go see Wow. And that's when I was just like, you guys are okay. You can go down there. And so we just gave him the keys to that kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so that's when things started to happen with them without us. And that's when I'm super relieved that, Ooh. you know, we did that because we had over 15 or 20 people come to this place and all have a story of one sort or another to tell. And you just, it, just to clarify, you were talking earlier about you're able to be at Owl Moon Lab for a few days to film. That's going to be part two. Yeah. Coming out next year, Memorial, Memorial Day. Memorial Day weekend, yeah. Oh, man. I'm Which will be, I can't not promote this. Uh, yeah, no, yes, please promote anything okay. you need to. Go the ahead. premiere is going to be in Forks, Washington, home of vampires and werewolves. Yes. And the, pre the premiere will be on Saturday evening. Doug Hycheck has signed on to be one of the keynote speakers, as well as uh, Cliff Berrickman, Tom Powell, David Ellis, who helped wow. with a lot of the Al Moon sounds. I would not be where I was with the audio clarity without David Ellis of the Olympic Project. Absolutely. There's going to be some surprises there as well. So there's going to be, a, there's a, as far as I know, and this is the first I brought this up, there's going to be a debate, oh, hopefully man. for Friday night. Really? There's going to be a debate between the flesh and blood and the paranormal side. And oh. we're going to host a fair and balanced conversation between two different hosts, myself and a gal named Nancy. And we're going to have a conversation about this on Friday night. So it should be a lot of fun. And this is all that is just for the premiere. There's a there's going to be some other things happening besides the premiere. This is part two is so crazy. Uh, I've seen who they've interviewed and you've never heard of these people. You've never heard their stories before. And what they brought to the table is so crazy that it, you thought part one was controversial. Wait till you see part two. It's got That's be why I love part one. Yeah. I was writing down names left and right. Cause I was like, yeah, who is this person? Obviously yeah. this person has way more of a story to tell because yeah. it's one documentary. You can't talk to one person forever, but some of these people I've never heard of. And it's like, I got to know more about this person yeah. and their story. Like it was so good. The people that they had. I didn't, so I can't wait for part two then. That's, yeah. that's amazing. I wish I could say who's promote these people early because they deserve to be promoted right now for their books that are out for their information that's out but you just can't do it but well, i'm so excited that we were able to talk to them and especially at phenomicon the people that we got to uh, talk to is like what yeah so very cool are you still raising money for this film or yeah okay. yeah there's if you go on to a uh, flash of beauty it mainly if you just go to the facebook book page and look okay. at flash of beauty there's links on there there's also an instagram account 
if you go into residence production, resident residence production company, there's also a link to the Flash of Beauty Kickstarter or crowdfunding with, that they're doing. It's such a good film. Everyone should check out Flash of Beauty. I'm I'm blown away. So is there is that a is there a conference going along with that premiere oh, or literally yeah yeah okay, so it's okay. Uh, the second annual sasquatch days okay in forks memorial that makes day weekend more sense. okay and so it's like, a friday saturday sunday right. gig that's um, great there's a bigfoot store across the street yes uh, yeah. there's always a lot of twilight stuff happening there oh yeah and forks is now turning into a bigfoot twilight i don't know what that would be called like a by light or something <laughs> <laughs> Forks is beautiful. I'll I'll share a little bit in uh, to my personal history, but I'll I'll just leave it at as uh, we've taken a, a a trip out to Forks for okay. maybe Twilight related reasons <laughs> back in the day. But it's a beautiful area, and I, I remember my favorite part. Actually, our favorite part was going in the Ho Rainforest and how beautiful. And it's that was before I was into the Bigfoot stuff. Now looking at it through the Bigfoot lens, it'd be like, mm. of course you've got Bigfoot in that area. Yeah. No question, dude. Yeah. Crazy. I have a question for you. And this is going to, so you mentioned Henry Franzoni mm -hmm. earlier. Are you as big a fan as I am of his 1990s Bigfoot documentary. Oh, yeah. Have you seen this thing? Oh yeah. Holy mackerel. And no one knows, no called, one really knows about Sasquatch it. Sasquatch Odyssey or. It's uh, like, it's a really weird name, but it's yeah. on, I saw it on Tubi and it's, it is so good. It's just yeah, like, we're, it's so nineties. Yeah. Yes. So good, man. Yes. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. In fact, I remember renting it from a place called Flicks and Picks on Willamette Street in Eugene, Oregon. It was in the the same spot you'd get a racer head, and there was Henry's <laughs> dock. And I was like, "What's this?" Wow, so, that really was my in search of with Leonard Nimoy. Was oh, that is so that cool in dude. the early nineties. Who is this cool ass hippie talking Bigfoot right now? So one, he's fantastic. I gotta talk to Henry someday, just because like in in Flash of Beauty, he's talking about like how he's like on the inside and able to talk to the different native American tribes. And it's just, is blowing my mind. But I don't know if you remember the, in the documentary, do you remember the older gentleman who's like living out in the trailer? Oh, Henry. Oh, Hint, Renee de Hendon. No, not Renee. De, it's, oh. it's not Renee de Hendon, but it's like this older gentleman in the Pacific Northwest, and he's like oh. out in this logging area in a weird. I don't trailer. remember. I'm gonna have to see it again. Yeah, it's literally in, been since the '90s since I've seen it. You, it's worth another look because it's just man. These people all have stories, and you know. Did you say it's free on around. Tubi? Yeah, so free okay. on Tubi. So the thing about Tubi is there's someone at Tubi that loves Bigfoot because there's at least twenty or thirty. Bigfoot movie documentaries and it's all free and yeah. Tubi's not a sponsor, but check it out guys. Including I mean, flash of beauty. So oh, if you want yeah, to watch hey, it for free, bring it around. Yeah. Is there a way you can watch it where you support the, the makers as well? Probably the best way to support it is to leave a review Perfect. at this point. And if you want to rent it or buy it, you still can do that on different platforms. But if you're just dying to see it and uh, see some of these new faces, cause it's important to mix it up with this conversation. And mm. we have a psychiatrist talk about Sasquatch in a way that's never been talked about from the ramifications, the emotional ramifications of having a paranormal. Let's just call it that because nobody believes Bigfoot's real except the people watching this right now. So the paranormal, right? Is and even foot. some of them don't believe. I'm not going to name right. names. Wink. So <laughs> having an encounter with something that shouldn't exist has extreme ramifications on emotional distress and how you mm. compartmentalize the rest of your life. Because, you know, we always like to say Bigfoot encounters are somewhere between striking the lottery and accidentally seeing a death or something happen uh, a wow. traumatic yeah, experience yeah, yeah, yeah. to where yeah. it's horrific and yet it's the luckiest day in the world and somewhere in between that is your bigfoot encounter types and so the difference is that you can tell someone that you won the lottery and that you saw mm -hmm. this horrific death 
Mm-hmm. But you can't necessarily tell anybody about this real event that happened to you. And if you do, the consequences are totally different, even mm-hmm. from medical science, from health and behavioral science. Looking into this phenomena has consequences of how people judge you and what they may oh, prescribe 100%, you. 100%. Yeah. In the time since Owl Moon Lab, your book has come out, have there been other things that have happened to you? Another way I could ask this question is, will there be a part two to Owl Moon Lab that comes out eventually? I will never just write a book to call it Owl Moon Lab, the extreme edition or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't even, I'd have to fake something in order to bring that out. I would Mm. love for there to be a sequel to this based upon where the evidence is going but honestly since the pandemic things have died down sure and they're just now starting to come together in a way that i think is really interesting so uh, the unfortunately the last three years have taken the wind out of the sails as far as research but i think the next three years are going to be pretty interesting i love that it it, i totally understand we all were that's the thing about that we all were there in one way or another and Mm -hmm. but the next year's I think stuff's going to keep happening. We can't mm. wait to hear all about it. Tobe, thanks so much for being on the the podcast. Do you mind, before we wrap things up, do you mind sharing how people can best keep up to date with what you're doing and all that? Oh, sure. Stuff? I'll be at the Toppenish Casino coming up here on the 21st and 22nd for the Bob Gimlin Researcher of the Year Award here Hello. near Yakima, Washington. Flash of Beauty will be shown and we'll have a table there and I'll have some of my personal items for sale there, including some wood sculptures that I do that have some interesting qualities to them. And you can meet the production crew that's coming up on the 21st and 22nd next week, October. And then, of course, fast forwarding to Memorial Day weekend. The second annual Sasquatch Days in Forks, Washington. Tickets are on sale now. You can go to Sasquatch the Legend. And I think tickets are like a lot cheaper at this point Mm -hmm. before they go into full ticket price. And so it should be a great show. Again, that'll be part two coming out. The Paranormal Bigfoot. And beyond that, I think it's really focusing on how the audience receives and reviews part two based upon opportunities that will happen. I know that we're going to try to be at the Phenomicon in Vernal, Utah, which is right outside of Skinwalker Ranch territory. Oh, that's awesome. And I imagine it would be a good time to be at Phenomicon 2023. So good. Thank you so much for coming on tonight, Tobe. It's been a great uh, chat with you. And I think we'll be checking in with you in the future as well. Thanks again. Thanks again. Here at Bigfoot Society, our goal is to provide a platform for those that have encountered Bigfoot to share their encounter in a safe environment. But we need to hear your story. If you've experienced something that you just can't explain, please send me an email at BigfootSociety at gmail.com. Then we can start the conversation. I know a lot of you have not shared your encounter at all. It's been 20 years. And it's time that you get this off your chest and then you can get some well-deserved rest because I know you haven't been sleeping. I understand what you're going through and I appreciate every one of you listening.